we have some striking new data concerning the gold buying habits of central banks. In the third quarter of this year alone, 400 tons of gold were purchased, marking levels not seen since the 1980s. What makes this even more intriguing is that we don't have full visibility on all the buyers. Theories suggest Russia and China are among these mystery buyers, but what does this mean for the global economy? And how do Russia and China fit into this picture? Let's take a closer look at the dynamics at play. Historically, central banks were net sellers of gold for many decades, particularly from the 1970s until around 2010. During that time, countries like Switzerland and the U.S. offloaded massive amounts of gold, with the U.S. alone losing 11,000 tons between 1950 and 1970. By 2010, the tide had shifted and central banks became net buyers once again. This shift marked a turning point, with significant purchases coming from unexpected places, countries like Mexico, Kazakhstan, the Philippines, and Vietnam. China, of course, is a major player in this game, but their actions remain shrouded in secrecy. We don't know exactly how much gold they're accumulating, but we know it's substantial. Russia, on the other hand, has been more transparent, though even they have become more opaque recently due to their involvement in the war with Ukraine. New players like Iran and Turkey have also entered the scene quietly amassing gold reserves. Japan, interestingly, had been sitting on a massive pile of gold that it chose not to reveal until recently, adding hundreds of tons to its balance sheet seemingly overnight. This raises an important question. Why are central banks across the globe, particularly in countries with strained relationships with the West, hoarding gold? One reason might be geopolitical tension and the uncertainty it brings. Gold has historically been viewed as a safe haven during times of instability and we are certainly in one of those times. On the surface, it might seem odd that countries are aggressively buying gold when many citizens, particularly in the US and Canada, seem to have little interest in it. However, central banks clearly see value in gold as a safeguard against economic turbulence. This points to a deeper issue, inflation. Inflation is a reality we're all grappling with and it manifests in two distinct ways. First, there's cost push inflation, which stems from the supply side of the economy. This type of inflation occurs when there are shortages of key resources. Think oil, food, and other essential commodities. The current economic environment, with an ongoing financial war between the U.S. and Russia, has exacerbated these shortages. Sanctions, supply chain disruptions, and the war in Ukraine have all contributed to a rise in fuel costs, which trickle down and affect the prices of almost everything. The second type of inflation is demand pull, which is more psychological in nature. It happens when consumers, expecting prices to rise, decide to buy goods now instead of waiting. This type of inflation feeds on itself and can spiral out of control, as it did in the late 1970s. Back then it was triggered by an oil embargo, but soon became a runaway problem. People rushed to buy goods before prices soared further, creating a vicious cycle of rising demand and prices. Ultimately, it took extreme measures, like those enacted by Paul Volcker, the then chairman of the Federal Reserve, to bring inflation under control by hiking interest rates to crippling levels. Today's inflation, however, is primarily driven by supply-side issues. Energy prices are high, supply chains are fractured, and manufacturers face rising costs that they pass on to consumers. The Federal Reserve, despite its power over monetary policy, can't drill for oil or grow food. They have no control over these bottlenecks, which are the main drivers of today's inflation. But what the Fed can do is influence the demand side. They're trying to preempt a scenario where today's supply-side inflation morphs into tomorrow's demand pull inflation. Their solution? Squeeze demand by raising interest rates to curb spending before inflation psychology takes hold. The Fed's approach has a high-stakes gamble attached to it. If they overshoot, they risk pushing the economy into a recession or worse, a deflationary spiral. While people are generally bracing for a recession, few seem to realize how deep it could go. The recession that's looming may be much more severe than expected, and no one seems fully prepared for it. Now, some might argue that when the going gets tough, central banks will simply turn on the printing presses again, flooding the economy with money as they did after the 2008 financial crisis. But this solution has proven ineffective. Quantitative easing, or QE, pumped trillions into the banking system, but it didn't do much for the real economy, 
Banks took the money and parked it at the Federal Reserve as excess reserves. It didn't lead to increased lending or economic growth. Similarly, ultra-low interest rates didn't spur the kind of investment many had hoped for. These tools just aren't as powerful as they used to be. What we're seeing now is a broader, more significant shift in the global financial system. For decades, the U.S. dollar has reigned supreme as the world's reserve currency. This doesn't mean the dollar will lose its reserve currency status overnight, but its role as a payment currency is under threat. A payment currency is simply a medium of exchange. Anything can fulfill that role, even something unconventional like baseball cards if both parties agree. What's happening now is that countries like China, Russia, and the members of BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, are actively working on new payment systems that bypass the dollar. These new payment systems could radically reshape global trade. Organizations like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, SCO, and OPEC Plus are involved in these efforts. Soon, we may see these alternative payment networks rolled out, fundamentally changing how we conduct international transactions. As the world shifts away from using the U.S. dollar for payments, the perceived value of the dollar itself may decline. This leads us back to gold. If you think of gold by weight, it doesn't change. An ounce of gold is an ounce of gold. Whether it costs $1,000 or $1,500, what fluctuates is the value of the dollar. When gold prices rise, it's often because the dollar is losing value. Conversely, when gold prices fall, it usually means the dollar has strengthened. The focus shouldn't just be on gold's price in dollars, but rather on the dollar's value relative to the stable weight of gold. History has shown us the resilience of gold during times of crisis. When World War I began in 1914, most major powers quickly abandoned the gold standard. They wanted to hang on to their gold reserves, which they viewed as real money that could help them win the war. The Bank of England, however, took a different approach, staying on the gold standard. British economist John Maynard Keynes advised them that maintaining their commitment to gold would preserve their credibility and, more importantly, their access to credit. This decision proved to be critical. England's adherence to the gold standard allowed it to secure huge loans from American banks, ultimately helping the Allies win the war. Fast forward to 1925 when Keynes was advising Winston Churchill. Churchill wanted to return to the gold standard at the pre-war price, but Keynes warned him that this was a mistake. The money supply had doubled during the war and trying to go back to the old gold price without adjusting for that inflation would plunge the economy into recession. Unfortunately, Churchill ignored this advice and Britain paid the price with an economic downturn that hit before the Great Depression. Keynes's relationship with gold wasn't always straightforward. By 1944, at the Bretton Woods Conference, he once again supported a form of the gold standard. His pragmatism is something we can learn from today. There's a time and place for gold, and while it may not be the cornerstone of the global financial system anymore, it still plays an essential role as a hedge against uncertainty. Supply-side inflation doesn't usually sustain itself. It tends to collapse under its own weight. Take oil prices, for example. When they spike high enough, people cut back on their consumption. They drive less, they stay home more, and the reduced demand causes prices to fall again. This self-correcting mechanism is already starting to play out. We're seeing inflation taper off in some sectors, though it remains high overall. But make no mistake, inflation is on the decline. What many don't realize is just how fast this disinflationary trend will accelerate. Disinflation means that while prices are still rising, they're doing so at a slower pace. In some ways, it can feel like deflation, even though it technically isn't. Real interest rates will rise as inflation drops, slowing the economy further. If things go too far, we could even tip into outright deflation a scenario where prices start falling and cash becomes one of the best performing assets. In a deflationary world, holding cash is advantageous because its real value increases as prices decline. While inflation erodes purchasing power, deflation does the opposite, making cash king. This is something most investors aren't prepared for. They're bracing for inflation to continue, but what happens when the opposite occurs? For example, Long-term U.S. Treasury bonds would perform very well in such a deflationary environment. If yields on 10-year bonds fall from 4% to 2.5%, comma bond prices would skyrocket, delivering substantial gains to investors. Few are positioned for this, but it's a scenario worth considering.